Dr. Austajik, thank you very much for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And let me welcome our next speaker, who's Dr. Robert Percy Marshall from Red Bull Leipzig, Germany. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to um, give you a talk about the role of creatine supplementation in conditions involving um, mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, this was a review paper that we published together with my colleagues uh, from Germany. And I quickly want to um, give you a short oversight, uh, an overview about um, possible ways of um, beneficial effects of creatine in these kind of conditions. So uh, regarding my person, um, I'm uh, the team doctor of um, RB Leipzig. Um, and before that, I've been working in Hamburg, uh, taking care of the professional football team there. Um, also doing research in um, bone research, basically. Um, did a second study in um, medical administration, micro nutrition therapy and regulatory uh, medicine, which uh, creatine was the first time that I had a closer look um, into this um, neutral component um, and made me or gave me the interest in going deeper into this um, subject. So I think um, you've seen plenty of these slides on how creatine is being um, endogenously produced in the kidney and the liver and in the blood. So I can quickly go over this. Um, also uh, creatine's function in the cell to maintain um, energy levels um, and creatine and phosphocreatine um, levels um, intracellularly should have been explained uh, in close detail. Um, this is a very interesting or very good paper from Professor Walliman uh, from Switzerland, who uh, has been talking here as well. And I think this has been uh, clearly um, explained to you in more detail before. Now, um, this is just uh, a quick slide um, to explain you how um, creatine and creatine phosphate um, kick into action in the cell. So creatine, as you all know, is um, the main function of creatine is in um, intracellular energetics to um, keep up the energetic homeostasis. Um, so um, phosphate and uh, phosphocreatine and ATP are the fastest, um, the fastest way to supply the cell with energy. Uh, let me just, I've been told to remove, uh, hang on. So remove uh, the background. Um, let me just check. Uh, no, I think for the moment I you have to go with me through this uh, and with my hair. Um, I think there's no other way to do this for the moment. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so um, what I want to explain to you is that a creatine and phosphocreatine uh, and ATP are the fastest way for the um, cell to basically uh, regenerate um, intracellular energy levels. So it's much faster, it's 40 times faster than the respiratory chain is 10 times faster than through glucolysis. So where do creatine, uh, where do you know creatine from and how do I most of the time use creatine for? Um, this is for athletic performance, for enhancing athletic performance. And there have been plenty of papers um, explaining this uh, in a very, very good manner um, on what kind of levels um, creatine helps um, in human um, biologic um, levels, 
um, how to improve athletic performance on a genetic level and on an energetic level. But there's much more to this. So the summary basically is that um, creatine has several functions in, on a cellular level. It is important for the energy homeostasis. It's important for the myofibril contraction and relaxation, for the actin polymerization, uh, for certain DNA replication and transcript transcription processes, as well as for the iron pumps and calcium handling. Additionally, as you have heard before, it's anti-lactatic and has antioxidative abilities. So the question arises with all these very specific, but at the same time, different intracellular mechanics, mechanisms and effects, um, is there more to creatine's effects on cell? So the question arises if it actually does have a benefit on my, mitochondrial survival. So our hypothesis, our hypothesis was that creatine supplementation may play an, an important role on, in improving cellular bioenergetics. And this was what we had a closer look at. So um, Professor Bonilla already showed that creatine does not only have an effect on the muscular system, but there are several different um, components in the human anatomy and physiology um, that creatine does actually make a difference and have a beneficial effect. The question remains, how does it help and why does it help? Might the mitochondrion be the most important denominator in this concept? This is our, um, also um, uh, a presentation that you probably have seen by Mrs. Harmon on all the different injuries and um, medical pathologies that creatine does make a difference, where it is effective, possibly, possibly effective, and not likely effective. Still, the question remains, what is the common denominator? And our hypothesis was that the common denominator is um, the mitochondria. If we talk about mitochondrial dysfunction, we should first define what mitochondrial function is. So mitochondrial function is defined as the main generation of energy, ATP generation. It is important for the calcium homeostasis for storage and transport. It regulates cellular apoptosis through MPTP. It regulates the function and cell metabolism through um, specific signaling, and it generates um, oxygen radicals. So mitochondrial dysfunction most of the time refers to the reduced ability of ATP production, but at the same time actually means that there are several other functions that can be affected and impaired that will lead to a mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, I want to show you this picture or image that we have actually adapted from uh, Mr. Ainsley on what happens on a bioenergetic level if we have um, an injury. So if we have an, an injury and a contusion or an infarction, this leads to a reduced perfusion, which causes hypoxia or an ischemic um, situation, reducing the amount of oxygen that can that is being brought to the cell. At the same time, we have um, a calcium, um, an inbound calcium, um, increased calcium um, level intracellularly, and we have a glutamate neurotoxicity 
which all um, affect the mitochondrion in a negative way. This basically um, decreases the oxidative respiration. We have a lower ATP level and accumulation of lactate. So basically we have a hyperacidity of the cell. We have a um, generation of um, oxygen radicals. So an increase in oxidative stress and cell damage, which ultimately um, causes inflammation. And we have an increase in apoptosis through the mobilization of MPTP. Now, what happens if we have a situation under creatine supplementation? Now, in this situation, we still have a hypoxic ischemic situation, but creatine directly counteracts the energy situation. So we have um, a membrane repolarization, which counteracts the glutamate neurotoxicity. We have um, the counteraction of the calcium um, channels. So calcium is intracellularly lowered. We have a direct antioxidative effect of creatine. So we have a reduction in oxidative stress. We have a reduction of lactate um, through the reduction of glycolysis. And we have a stabilization of the MTP, T, MPTP pore so a reduction in apoptosis. So as you can see, creatine in a traumatic situation of an injury, contusion, or infarction, the creatine directly counteracts the inhibiting and the damaging factors and protects the cell on, an, on a bioenergetic level. And this is basically what we can, what we can see in, in research. So... Studies that regard in vivo effect of creatine on any kind of traumatic mitochondrial dysfunction. We have animal cere cerebral studies that have shown that pre ischemic or pre traumatic, this kind of creatine supplementation leads to lower lactate levels, to less brain swelling, to a reduced infarction size, less scar tissue after spinal cord injury to an improved fetal survival rate after acute hypoxia at birth, if the mother has gotten um, creatine supplementation, and a reduction in clinical impairment of behavioral parameters. Even more interesting, creatine supplementation in human cerebral studies has shown that it leads to reduced fatigue, headaches, dizziness, and improved cognition, after my um, traumatic brain injuries in children. Similar, we have found very interesting effects of creatine supplementation in um, cardiac traumatic mitochondrial dysfunction. However, it seems like creatine supplementation needs to be administered differently. So our administered um, creatine apparently does not have a, such a great effect, but there has to be a different way of approach. So um, fossil creatine injections directly into the left ventricle have had an antiarrhythmic effect on um, animal studies. In human studies, um, Mixing the cardioplegic solution during a heart surgery also leads to a better cardiac function and to a reduced incidence of post-operative arrhythmias. So we have clear evidence that creatine has a great beneficial effect on traumatic mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, do we see a similar effect on chronic mitochondrial dysfunction. 
first of all, let us define what chronic traumatic at uh, chronic mitochondrial dysfunction means. Um, this is just a, a short summary on the direct effects. And because we're lacking a little bit of time, um, let me just quickly summarize this before I go into the chronic um, mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, this is where I see great benefits in um, athletic performance and athletic creatine um, supplementation because creatine directly counteracts damaging cellular mechanisms. It lowers the risk of apoptosis in hypoxic conditions. It protects from inflammation and cell damage, and it stabilizes the calcium gradient. So it helps us in concussions and contusions, in tetanus trauma, and most likely has a beneficial effect in the if, uh, unlikely event of a su sudden cardiac um, arrest or death. Now, I was already starting to talk about the chronic mitochondrial um, dysfunction. If we talk about lifestyle risk factors and cardiovascular disease, already in 2008, there has been published this very interesting pyramid um, that shows that um, death, coronary diseases, cardiac arrhythmias, heart failure, stroke, and cognitive decline ultimately are being caused by poor dietary habits, physical activity, smoking, which lead to adipositis, um, endothelial dysfunction, and metal metabolic dysfunction. Why is that? Why does poor dietary habits, physical inactivity, and smoking lead to death? Now, we know that population over the past 100 and 1,000 years have grown healthier, but things have apparently changed. We know that infectious diseases have been reduced um, to a very less, uh, lesser degree. So in the 19th century, infectious diseases accounted for about 30% of the causes of death whereas in the end of the 20th century, it was less than 4%. Obviously, that was before COVID. But still, most people die of non-infectious diseases. But, but they die from the usage of tobacco, physical inactivity, and overweight. So traditional risks have been lowered, whereas new um, behavior risks have risen. We call this non-communicable diseases, which consists of cardiovascular disease, cancer, COVD, and diabetes mainly. Now, you might have all learned this way of energy homeostasis. Basically, glucose is being imported into the cell, um, being um, produced into pyruvate, acetylcholine A, and then um, through different steps being um, transformed into um, ATP. So one glucose is basically producing 38 ATP, um, under the usage and under the help of different micronutritions, vitamins, and minerals. If we have an accumulation of oxidative stress, of a change in dietary, so if we have uh, uh, insulin resistance or diabetes, lactate raises. We have a hyperacidity of the cell and we have a reduced production of energy, just like I've explained to you before in a traumatic situation. So we have a very similar mitochondrial dysfunction in chronic conditions compared to traumatic conditions. 
And this is what we call the Warburg effect. The Warburg effect was firstly invented and found in cancer cells. Um, and basically it was shown that even though we have enough oxygen, the cell still produces not the amount of energy that we would expect. So instead of producing 36 mole of ATP, only two to four mole are being produced and the cell becomes hyper, um, hyper acidic. So we can actually reprint or alter this pyramid and say that poor dietary habits, physical inactivity and smoking lead to a, chronical, a chronic mitochondrial dysfunction, which ultimately lead to chronic diseases, to chronic non-communicable diseases, which again lead to death. Stress and an altered microbiome actually add to this problem. And this is what it ultimately looks like. We have overnutrition, processed food, sedentarism, harming drugs and genetics and epigenetics or toxic situations, which actually, actually lead to mitochondrial dysfunction, which ultimately lead to non-communicable chronic diseases like cardiovascular disorders, insulin resistance, obesity, cancer, and neurodegenerative diseases. Whereas caloric restriction, exercise, mitochondrial targeted drugs, and re uh, optimized regeneration make us healthier, which obviously is how we should live our lives. So question is, does creatine also positively influence chronic mitochondrial dysfunction? Research shows that non-communicable diseases are associated with low-grade inflammation and increased oxidative stress. Obesity and diabetes mellitus show impaired ATP production as well as radical oxidative um, oxygen radicals and calcium is handling. And reduced creatine levels have been detected in human myocytes and diabetes mellitus, obesity and hypertension. So there is a very fundamental hypothesis that creatine could actually help us in treating these disorders. Now let us have a look. Studies that regard in vitro effect on creatine in the metabolic syndrome. In animal studies, we could actually see that creatine supplementation prevents the, de the development of a fat liver and hepatic complications. From human studies, we know that creatine supplementation induces the GLUT4 trans transmembrane trans translocation and increases insulin sensitivity. It basically counteracts diabetes mellitus. It activates anabolic genes, activates cell satellite cells, and increases glucagon storages. It enhances the beneficial effects of exercises, is as effective as metformin, and reduces blood triglycerols and LDL cholesterol. So we see that creatine has a very beneficial effect in the handling of the metabolic syndrome, especially if it is combined with physical exercise. Studies regarding the in vivo effect of creatine on cardiovascular disorders are not as promising. Um, there have been no papers whatsoever or no research that has really shown any direct beneficial effect in the clinical cause of these kinds of disorders. However, obviously, um, if we have physical, increased physical activity this is of a beneficial effect, but the sole creatine supplementation apparently has no beneficial effect on the course of cardiovascular disorders. What about cognition, depression, and neurodegenerative disorders? We've already talked about it uh, with Professor Ostoich. Um, we know that these kind of disorders, aging, cognitive defects, and neurodegeneration are related to um, the overproduction of uh, oxygen radicals 
and mitochondrial DNA impairment. We know that insulin resistance is related to neurodegenerative disorders and that the accumulation of rage and ammonium levels lead to documented mitochondrial damage. So if we look on, of, on, on creatine effect in animal studies, it shows that under creatine supplementation, there is a reduced need of sleep. It actually may help or serve as an analgesic aid via influencing ion channels. And in human studies, it is, has been proven that it preserves cognitive abilities under stressful conditions, such as hypoxia and sleep deprivation. It increases cognitive abilities independent of age and gender. So it was shown in children and in geriatric research. It improves the quality of sleep. It may slow down Parkinson's disease, but it has no effect on other neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Huntington, or ALS. There has already uh, also been um, an antidepressant effect in the combination of creatine supplementation and antidepressant uh, medication. The increase of cerebral PCR levels has shown to be inversely correlated with manic or depressive syndromes. So taken together, creatine has positive effects on cognitive function, positive effects on sleep, beneficial effects on psychiatric disorders. But although having had um, promising results in animal studies, nearly no effects on the cause of neurodegenerative disorders. I'm sorry. Um, we've heard already about the post fatigue syndrome. So because we're lacking time, I just quickly skip this. So the take home message is that mitochondrial dysfunction is characterized through an energetic deficit, hyperacidity, the overproduction of radical um, oxygen radicals and inflammation. Creatine has been shown to be a potent therapeutic agent in acute mitochondrial dysfunction um, on CNS, so central nervous system and cardiac uh, um, if, um, events. The non-communicable diseases have become an increasingly threatening um, or threat to modern civilization. Mitochondrial dysfunction seems to be the common root in many of these chronic diseases and creatine supplementation just, in, uh, just as in the traumatic situation has been shown to be able to improve non-communicable diseases like insulin resistance, diabetes mellitus, depression, and post-viral fatigue syndrome. So creatine might prove to be a potent agent in improving cognition and sleep as well as reducing pain. But obviously, like uh, ever so often for a better understanding of administration, dosage and possible creatine combinations need um, to be, have a, uh, you need, we need a better look and uh, more research on the administration and the dosage and possible different creatine combinations in larger studies for better understanding. And given this, I thank you for your attention and I hope um, you have enjoyed the conference. Thank you very much. 